2017 was a year filled with a lot of nice things. John Wick 2, Logan, a new Unleash the Archer CD, and it was a year that was densely packed with great games. I have 10 favorites, I'm going to count them down. Without further delay, here are the top 10 games I played in 2017. You know, at the beginning of 2017, comparing a game to Dark Souls wasn't this super trite way of saying that you suck at video games. For example, when Neo came out, that comparison still made sense. What I think separates Neo from Dark Souls and Bloodborne, however, is that its quicker paced combat, for me anyway, felt like the payoff to struggle ratio was a little better. Boss battles ranged from humanoid duels that felt like chess matches between two equals, to giant blob monsters with weaknesses you need to exploit. The feudal Japan setting made for a great backdrop for the levels, ruined villages, yokai infested forests, haunted mines, and many more intricately designed levels that were a blast to struggle through. The story was, well, as good as it needed to be. It gave context to the adventure, even if the number of times I actually knew what was going on were few and far between. All in all, Neo was exciting, really challenging most of the time, but never boring. And with an action game like this, that is all I can really ask for. So, last year my trek through the classics of the previous generation consisted of me playing the Bioshock series. Shortly after playing those, I decided my next expedition was going to be the Uncharted series. Well, most of it. What I have played though, I found pretty great, and my favorite of the bunch was Uncharted 2. It took all of the cool things about the first game and improved on them. Cooler environments, better action set pieces, they even took the shooting that I felt pretty much got in the way, and made it Okay, well not great, but they made it better. <laughs> That's all I can ask for in that case. The new characters introduced in Uncharted 2 were also pretty good. I really liked Chloe. The game was also paced excellently. I tore through this in a single sitting, and it rarely felt like it was dragging on. Overall, the stellar pacing and excellent presentation made this Nathan Drake treasure hunt one to remember. Bayonetta 2 is ridiculous in all of the best ways. The game starts by taking it up to 11 and just doesn't quit escalating. The first level is this fight on top of a jet that just keeps getting more crazy as time goes on. And the final battle ends with your giant hair demon drop kicking the villain into the jaws of another giant hair demon. And the entire time in between is just as crazy. As far as the gameplay goes, the stylish action is second only to the Devil May Cry games in my opinion. The weapons are all fun to experiment with and exciting to master, the scythe is one of my personal favorites, the combos all flow really well together, and tearing into large groups of enemies without missing a beat is exhilarating. Which time rewards you for perfect dodges by slowing time down and making it easier to nail an enemy with a monster specific finisher. The characters all do well to serve their purpose, and they're all over the top and crazy in their own way. The story is... Well, good enough for something as wacky as this, and does a good enough job at setting up Bayonetta's motivation for the game. Bayonetta 2's start to finish full throttle action easily won me over, and I am more than excited for the third game that was recently announced. The Last Day of June is one of those games that will punch you in every emotion, from its Tim Burton like art style to its heartbreaking setup. The gist of the game is that Carl loses his wife, June, to a tragic car accident, and is paralyzed from the waist down. Sometime after the accident, he is granted this ability to return to the day of the accident and alter the details of the events of the day in an effort to save June from her untimely passing. The rest of the gameplay revolves around reliving this Groundhog Day-like time loop in an effort to help Carl achieve his goal. There's more to the game that I won't dare spoil, but take my word for it, if you enjoy emotionally rich storytelling in games, check this one out. <laughs> Persona 4 is so aggressively what it is and doesn't apologize for anything, and I love it for that. First of all, I really like the take on combat that this game has. Being able to switch between personas like their ability loadouts gives your player character an element of versatility that I really enjoy. 
Mixing and matching personas to try and fuse them together is also something I really liked. The bosses were exciting. I found that in almost every encounter I was pitifully underleveled when I first fought them, but it was never too much work to go and grind out to be a more appropriate level. Outside of combat and dungeons, the gameplay was still enjoyable. I wasted so much time just putzing around the different locations that you could visit throughout the day. The story is pretty interesting too. It's set up like a murder mystery, with the murderer throwing people into the TV world where the dungeons are. It helps to have an underlying sense of unease even when the main focus happens to be elsewhere. I enjoyed most of the characters too, my favorites being Kanji, Marie, Yosuke, Nanako, and Yukiko. They may mostly be filling in archetypes, but they're done in such a way that I really do enjoy them, and they all have a tangible arc progression depending on how much time you want to spend with each of them. The way everything comes together in Persona 4 is an enjoyable blend of fun JRPG action and a world that is a pleasure to get lost in. And from what I hear, Persona 5 is even better. So. Super Giant does it again. I tell you, at this point, they could probably sell me a cyanide smoothie, and I would not think twice about buying it. Pyre is another case of something being completely different from either of their previous projects, but still obviously feeling like a Super Giant game. The setup is really interesting. You take on the role of the Reader, who is taken in by the Nightwings, a group of outcasts who are trying to win their way back into society. They do this by taking part in a super ritualistic game of 3 vs 3 handball, and it is awesome. The rest of the game is spent traversing the downside's wonderful environments, going from ritual to ritual. Seriously though, I found myself comparing the imagery of the game to something that you would see in a Dr. Seuss book. Along the way, you meet several interesting characters that join your party at a healthy pace. They all have certain nuances in the gameplay that make them worth trying out at least once. And they are all pretty cool personality-wise. All have some kind of personal stake or intrigue when it comes to running into other groups of outcasts. Some of my favorite characters being Pamatha, Jodario, and Ruki. The soundtrack in this game is excellent. It sets the stage for the world and events of the game perfectly. Each different group of outcasts has their own theme, each character you join also has their own theme, and a lot of songs have dynamic instrument tracking to suit the situation that is happening on the screen. Or in the case of one of the vocal songs, completely changing some of the lyrics to suit what is happening. Partway through the game, I had myself thinking that I was gonna like Pyre as much as Bastion or Transistor. I could not have been more wrong. This game is amazing, and I'm probably going to jump back into the downside with my fellow exiles for another go before too long. Remember when I said that the last day of June was a game that would hit you in every emotion? Well, to the moon is kind of like that. It grabs every heartstring you have and just slowly starts snipping them away. This game is like the first 10 minutes of the Pixar movie Up, but with all the emotional intensity spread out and maintained over the course of several hours. It covers the story of Johnny and his inexplicable desire to go to the moon, which is intertwined with his relationship to his wife River, who had just recently passed before the events of the game start. Backtracking through Johnny's life and uncovering the details of Johnny and River's story just sucks you into the game. As heartbreaking and emotionally trying as the story is, there's still a level of levity and catharsis by the time that it's all said and done. The events are all underlined by an absolutely beautiful score. Everything's Alright and Four River are personal favorites of mine. To the Moon is one of the best video game stories I've ever experienced, and as I said with The Last Day of June, go and play it if you enjoy emotionally rich stories. And then, Go play Finding Paradise, because it is just as good. So now we reach a point where anything I say about this next entry will be redundant, because it's already been said. But screw it, I'm gonna say it anyway. Super Mario Odyssey is awesome. The level of creativity and charm present in this game is through the roof. It's the same basic Mario blueprint, jump around and collect stuff, but it's how the game goes about doing its business that makes me love it. 
All the levels are open-ended and a lot of fun to explore. Throwing your head at different enemies to see what you can take control of and what kind of special function taking control of that particular enemy will do. All of the levels are visually interesting and are all designed in a way that feel unique to one another, even if they contain similar enemies or elements from time to time. For example, there are two water levels in the game, but both have a very distinct feel from one another. The game never ceased to be interesting either. Every time I hit a point that made me go, alright, this is my favorite part. It was shortly topped by another awesome moment right after that. I haven't even scratched the surface of everything there is to do. All I really did was beat Bowser and watch the credits roll before I moved on to playing Zelda again. But one thing is for certain, when I do return to the game, there will be plenty more power moons to find and much more fun to be had. Horizon Zero Dawn was a game that had me straight from its premise. Society has been set back to an era of using rocks and sticks to beat each other into submission, but technology from society's collapse is still a lingering presence in the form of ruins and robot dinosaurs. The game follows the story of Aloy, an outcast of the Nora tribe, trying to win her way back into her tribe's society and learn who her mother was. Aloy eventually starts exploring outside of the tribal lands and trying to figure out the mysteries of the world that used to be. The combat in this game is awesome. It seriously has the most satisfying bow and arrow combat that I've ever played with. Other weapons and skills make for useful and enjoyable ways to take down any of the wide array of machines. Nothing in this game is more exciting than going at it with a Thunderjaw. There's also no shortage of things to do, be it finding collectibles, harvesting materials for upgrades, or taking on a hunting ground challenge. Character-wise, this game has some charming side characters, and then it has Aloy, who is one of the best main characters in a video game since at least 2010. She's the right amount of strong, snarky, and well-intentioned. By the end of the game, if someone tries to attack her, she just rolls her eyes and puts them in their place. The world Horizon creates is pretty interesting, but I don't think it would be as fun to explore if Aloy wasn't as good of a character as she is. I also think that the game's answer to what happened to the world of before was cool. Not going to spoil it, but it was just different enough from the usual apocalyptic story plot points in that regard, and I really liked it. They also released the DLC for this game at the perfect time. I didn't beat all of it, but when I started it up, I knew that I had been away from the game just long enough to miss it. Once I get back to it, I'm sure it will do little to tide me over until the inevitable sequel. I don't even know where to begin with The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I'm gonna take a crack at starting with the presentation. Visually, this game reminds me of a Studio Ghibli movie. It is gorgeous. You could take a still of any of the scenery and it would be screenshot worthy. And the coolest part is that all that scenery that you see in the horizon, you can eventually get to. Because you can climb everything. There's just something so cool about setting off to do one thing, and then deciding that you want to take this raft that you see off to the side to this island off in the distance because you think something cool might be hiding away there. The world that Breath of the Wild creates is pretty cool. It strikes a nice balance between being desolate and recovering. It's a big and explorable world like most open world RPGs, but it's got all the nice charms of a usual Zelda world too. The combat in this game is probably the most exciting it's been in the series being more about well-timed dodges or finding a creative solution than swinging in the correct direction like in Skyward Sword. People complain about the weapon degradation, but you end up picking up enough stuff off the ground or from enemies that it didn't really bother me all that much when I lost my soldier's broadsword for the eighth time. The shrines being bite-sized dungeons were a great addition. It really did well to pack the world full of stuff to do. Oftentimes I had myself thinking I was going to go to bed after completing this shrine right in front of me only to be up for two more hours getting distracted by the other three of them that are around me in the distance. The Divine Beast are interesting takes on the dungeons, if a little easy. I liked being able to control certain parts of them for the purposes of solving puzzles. The characters in this game fill most of the usual roles that characters do in Zelda games. Impa does Impa things, King of Hyrule does King of Hyrule things, the champions serve their roles pretty well, and some of the other side characters also have a lot of charm to them. Cass, the Bolson construction people, and any of the tribes you come across have at least a couple neat characters. But the two most important characters are, as usual, Link and Zelda, and this game has my favorite version of both of them. 
Zelda undergoes an interesting arc where she struggles with an identity crisis, caught between the person she wants to be and caught between the person she's being told to be. This may not be, you know, a groundbreaking story in terms of general fiction, but the character of Zelda has never went through this before, and I thought it was really good. And as far as Link goes, his dialogue options actually have some personality to them this time. Some of them are snarky, some of them make puns, which brings me no shortage of joy. The story of the game is spread out over the massive world, so unless you're specifically looking for it, you'll end up tripping over a plot event while exploring elsewhere. So, Breath of the Wild came out and set a new standard for adventure games and open world RPGs and has easily become one of my favorite games ever. But the truly awesome thing is that I'm pretty sure the next Zelda game is going to be even better than this one. 